All right, everyone, welcome to our second in our series of artist talks in conjunction with the Artists of Hawaii Now exhibition at the Honolulu Museum of Art. Um, thank you so much for joining us. I am Marlene Su, co-curator of the Artists of Hawaii Now exhibition, and I'm so excited to be here with two of our featured artists, Gwen Arkin and Mami Mei Sing. Hi, guys. Um, so before we get started, I'm just gonna go over a little bit of housekeeping. Um, we do have closed captioning available for this uh, webinar. So if you would like to activate your closed captioning, feel free to click that button, the CC button at the bottom of your screen on the right-hand corner. And then also we'll be taking questions throughout this talk from the audience. So if you do have a question that you would like to pose to the artist, please uh, use the Q&A function. I will be monitoring the Q&A function. So please type in your questions there and um, we'll communicate them to the artist. Um, I think that's it. So let's uh, go ahead and begin our talk story. So first up, um, I would like to introduce Manu Mei Singh. Um, Manu is a multimedia artist based in Honolulu, Hawaii. He works with paper, sequential narratives, and digital as well as generative, generative art to explore the social structures and tensions with the US empire's economic landscape. His mathematically logical landscape employs visual, in, visually enticing and emotionally alluring colors, waveforms, flora and fauna, to chart how individuals create emotional apparatuses to cope, fight, change, or simply exist within this inegalitarian society. Thank you, Manu, so much for joining us. Um, so excited to have you. Um, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, mahalo for having me. And uh, thank you to you, Marlene, and to the folks who are helped put this on and to the museum. And many thanks to my co-panelist, Gwen. I'm so happy to be here with you. So yeah. So uh, let me, so I've got a quick about 10 minute presentation and then we'll sort of exam run through the, the project. So I'm gonna, uh, let me, I'm gonna share my screen and then I'm gonna put myself in presentation mode. Let's just see if we can, okay. So let me share my screen and then see if I can uh, put it in presentation mode afterwards. And I just need someone to just let me know that the presentation mode has worked. So one second. Does, does it working? Are you all seeing it? Yes, it looks great. Okay, so, so that the piece is about wages and what are we worth? And that's sort of the question, the overall question I'm sort of asking through this piece. Um, and the background of this piece is um, a the randomness of, of, of the housework seed. And we'll sort of talk about that. So, okay. So just to go through the seeds and we'll talk about what that means, but the first one is housework. So that's this uh, minimum wage, which is these sort of patterns and dots, right? Food preparation workers, which are triangles that sort of uh, take, over, take over the street screen, but also stay within themselves. And the wage is the seed and we'll talk a little more about that concierges and travel agents, sales representatives, the wage, securities, commodities, financial services, sales agents, managers, and then the chief executives, the CEOs, which is like kind of this crazy Maximilian thing. Okay. So the, I, I'm gonna, the seeds will make sense in a second, and but I'm gonna step away and talk about the conceptual genealogy. And the background for this is one of the early renditions for, um, uh, travel agents. Okay. So on the left hand side is the uh, a special bulletin and a poster for the International Wages for Housework campaign. It started in the 70s. It never really ended. Um, it's still sort of ongoing. And so there are these posters of a uh, woman, a, a, mo a mother working, a mother working, right? And then there's these ideas of wages. On the right hand side is the economic. Uh, the Organization for Economic Cooperative Development. And this is their, um, all of their countries plus China, India, and South Africa, an average minutes per day spent on routine housework. 
uh, by gender. And gender here, I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm specifically staying within the binary of male and female. Uh, the left-hand side is male, which is um, the lowest end is 19 minutes a day from India. And India also has the highest amount of labor that women or housework that women do at 298 minutes per day. Um, where the US is, I think, men put in about 76 minutes a day and women put in 124 minutes a day. So uh, almost twice as much men put in. Um, Sweden is the closest at equality at 79 minutes for men and 95 minutes uh, for women. Korea, Japan, um, Turkey are up there uh, as well as Mexico with uh, these, these the stark differences. So, okay. So now on, on the other end of the equation is or this sort of scale is this, this idea of, of the, the working world, right? And so I have this poster of uh, old film, my, uh, Behold the Mightiest Man Ever Lived, Atlas, Feared by Every Man, Desired by Every Woman, right? He's holding up the world, right? In this case, I'm really speaking of the working world, right? And next to that is also the OED, OCED. This is the hours worked by countries. I'm my, and it doesn't say this, there's no gender breakdown, but there's some things to consider. Um, Mexico is uh, one of the highest, as is the United States. Uh, Sweden is one of the lowest. And just to flip back, um, Mexico is, has the highest women put in the most, one of the most times per day into housework, minutes per day in housework, right? So you can sort of make your own sort of conclusions on what this means, and we can discuss if we want to. Okay. So when I did this piece, I spent a lot of time on the labor statistics board, and this is um, one of the screens and all of this data is publicly available. You can always check and see how much you make versus how much you think you should be making. Um, they publish this, the United States publishes this every year. And so state of Hawaii, Honolulu, Kauai, and, and the other counties, um, and this is just an example of what, of what chief executives all the way down to managers all make, right? Um, so this is sort of the other part of the equation that I started with. Okay, uh, all right. So now that to, these are sort of the artistic inspirations. Um, okay, so the, the top left with these spiraling dots are Conway's Game of Life, which is cellular, re it's a mathematic mo model for reconstructing how cells the divide and die. The second piece of these swirls is the Lorenz attractor, which is actually, I used it as the equation for housework. It's also chaos. Uh, the one next to it is Ruth Asawa's work. Um, the bottom left is Pete Mondrian, Keith Haring, um, uh, Mobius and nature, right? So all of these sort of people who are drawing or thinking or non, not thinking about complex systems, but are into, and somehow working with them. Okay, all right. So now we can talk a little bit more about the math and the seeds. <laughs> this is the fun part, now it's kind of crazy. So the top left is the equation for the Lorenz attractor for making chaos. So when I talk about, I'm gonna go back, and when I talk about these seeds on the bottom left, these wages, some of these numbers got into these equations and, and affected the outcome of the piece and how it was formed. I worked within a 3D plane, that's the next image. And the image after that is a breakdown of the math of fractals, which is a new image is equal to the old image squared plus C. And then to the next of that is Conway's game of life or cell division you start with one size and you just sort of zoom out. The, the part of math is really to model human behavior, right? And so one of the big things is modeling flocking of birds. So that's the, that side. The middle image is moving from Euclidean to non-Euclidean space. With, and so part of these equations was doing this, part of this math was moving these, these, uh, these data things and these feelings and what these numbers mean turning them to conditions that check if they're true or false and then running them. 
and the bottom left is the other where the word seed comes from right is i'm 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 really inspired by nature and so seed is i plant the seed i hit play but i don't really have any control over what happens afterwards just as though you can water a plant there's so many other factors um the middle bottom is is uh, the, is an example of randomness where you have a, a statistical model and within that you figure out how you want to work with random numbers. And this, the far right image is um, taken from sacred geometry. Math means so many different things to so many of us. So um, I, I encourage us all to sort of explore what that means, whether it's faith-based, any, any really base, right? Okay. All right. So that's the end of this part of the presentation. And now what I'm gonna do, um, where am I with time also? I worked, I work pretty fast. You are, <laughs> you're actually, you're really good on time. You're great. Oh, great, great, okay. So what I wanna show you all next is, um, I'm gonna uh, just minimize everything on my screen. And you can just take a look at the code because in the end of the day, I mean, that's what all of this is. So what I'll do is, uh, is I'll, uh, I'll show you the big switch where everything is run. So, and then I'll share with you an example of the whole piece. So share my whole screen uh, when you were you know when you were determining the the different wages that you're going to pull for pull from to inspire the individual um visual representations how did you decide which wages you would choose in terms of um that specific seven since there's so many that you could have chose from just from that this from that chart that you showed us from the data why, why it, those seven? Because um, altogether there's eight, and on one end is CEOs, because I think they're, and for many people who, who really want to make it in life, this is like the ultimate vision, become a CEO, to maybe made $200 an hour. And I, and I feel it, you know, if you're if broke and you want to make the money, why not, right? And this is a vision of, and a fantasy of this thing I want to be but there's also complexity there and you really have to think through what, what that's about. And on the other end is this, nobody, nobody wants to do housework. And part of it I think is because it's unpaid, um, but someone does it. And the question is, what does that mean? And so these are, these are the two sort of poles. Um, um, and then between that, I think there's a, a shade, a few shades. And I stuck with these because I, I think people understand these jobs. And, and though I, the way the code is written, you're more likely to see housework, minimum wage seeds, um, concierges and dishwashers than you are to see an example of a CEO. And part of that is just, I think, I really wanted to focus on these, but I wanted to have this sort of breath. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, so I'll just share with you all, I'll just, uh, I'm gonna share my whole screen. You can see the code. <laughs> yeah. So this is the tip of the iceberg. There's, a, there's like over 200 lines written, but these are the switches that turn everything on. And I have no real control over it. So once I hit play, and hopefully you can now see, see it in action, yeah? So this is housework. And again, this is inspired by chaos. And the equation is on is is literally wage a wage dropped in. I think I used I end up using the final for 0 0.08 cents, so there's just one. Um, but is this idea of things just sort of eating themselves, and the anxiety and the de depression, and the resentment of doing this thing, which is important but often goes unappreciated, right? Um, and then I'll just show you guys. And so this is the equation, these are the equations. So, um, and then I'll just do one more and then I think that will give you a good sense. And so this is, uh, um, 
this is the most often, which is dishwashers, which is folks. And this is also how many of these jobs exist. You're more likely to get a job as a dishwasher, right? So it's easier, it's easier to access than other jobs, um, though you may not take it, right? So and we'll just do one more. Oh, and again, I have no control over what we see. I just hit the button. Oh, so, okay, this is what we're meant to see today, so. <laughs> um, Lonnie, yeah, when you, there's, oh. go, no, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, you know, when you were describing this, this piece here, you were talking about depression. And can you talk a little bit more about um, the visual aesthetic and um, your process when you were creating these different visuals for each scene? The, uh, the visual aesthetics and the process. Um, I, the colors that are used throughout are, are carried through. And pink was definitely, a, it's there because it's, it's a gendered color. So pink ends up going through the piece. And there's a whole body of literature that talks about the feminization of work and a whole body of other literature that, that says so much about masculinity and work. Um, uh, but I pulled and I wanted to start looking like a painting and then it also started to weave, right? So, but again, I don't really have any control um, and I wanted to somehow sort of, uh, I guess be pleasing, but also sort of sort of speak to the, uh, I'll just sort of annotate. I don't know if you guys can see this, but this is this giant hole that's sort of eating itself. And uh, um, it'll look different on every screen. And then after five minutes and it resets, and actually this is interesting because I've never actually seen it do this, where it resets almost in the same position, um, but really focusing on itself. So did I answer your question? Um, yeah, sort of. I just. You know, I, it's it's really interesting how each seed is so different in the way that it generates itself and the way that it moves. And, you know, it was interesting when you were describing this piece that you were associating a feeling to it. And I was wondering if if that's something that you were consciously or subconsciously um, placing on each each seed, the way that you determined how it would move, how it would generate the, whether the pace of it would be slow or quickly, you know, some of these are very expansive where other ones are very, um, very minuscule and almost anxious feeling. And I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, no, definitely. Um... Part of this is definitely that anxiety of doing the same thing over and over and over again. Um, uh, my mom did a lot of our housework and when she wasn't well, I, was, I would do it. And so I sort of watched, grow up with her resentment at, at sort of leaving her career and having, or having two jobs, right? Most women have, you have children, you have two jobs. You have a job at work and then you have a job at home, right? Um, and the other is like the minimum wage is just like the ideas of like never, let's see, let's learn it one more time so we can get, uh, I'm gonna just get out of this. Let's just see if we can run and see if we get something else and then we can sort of talk about it. <laughs> okay, so this is, um, uh, this is minimum wage, right? And this is the idea of moving forward and moving backwards. This produces a shape on its own that it, it'll never reproduce the same thing twice because it's a little bit like a living thing. So it chooses the direction and it goes and it goes backwards and it goes forwards. So there's color, the color is also set to random. And so it overrides itself and it moves forward. And the idea is we, it's for every dollar we make, we, it's a dollar we lose. And so it's, it's always sort of backtracking and never really getting far enough. Um, and so that there's there's points where this it slowly starts to break away from itself and then it just double downs. Um, it picks a direction, it goes back. Um, 
And so this is this feeling of just being stuck in these ruts, right? And the, what's really interesting about economies, everyone has a form of this now, you know? Everyone, the, regardless of how much you make, you can sort of find your own rut. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Does that, that answer? Yeah, absolutely. And it, and you know, it's interesting that your your work deals with so so much with time, right? And that, but these these pieces only exist in a very specific moment in time. And do you do you have any record of them after the five minutes? Of once they're gone, are they gone, or or do do they live on somewhere else? The the computer that's there takes a photograph uh three times a day of itself and so there's a bit of self-reflection that will be really interesting to take on after the piece is done at the museum mm -hmm. i think i'll i i did the math i don't remember it now how many photos i'll have but i think it'll be really fascinating to be like if someone was like this is the day i went and i can i'll know i'll have a memory of the day and what was shown um yeah, and so this is concierges and travel agents. And again, it's um, a connected world, but also sort of entrapping <laughs> in a it's world that's like hard to leave. It's kind of interesting that idea that you have like a, almost like a time log, like you're keeping track of the work. <laughs> yeah. That you'll be able to um, compile at the end of this. Um, did you want to talk a little bit about um, like why why this piece? You know why you know when when Taylor Chang, the um, our my other co curator, and I um, first from the beginning from the inception of this exhibition, you know we we placed the call to the community for artists to create work that addresses urgent issues relevant to our time and place. And so why why did you answer the call with this piece? Why now? Why wages? For most of us, wages have been stagnant since the 1970s, while the cost of everything else has gone up. So a good example is you can compare it to is uh, gas, right? I think in, in the 1990s, what was it here? In 2000, it was maybe a dollar, two dollar, now it's almost six dollars. But wages have most for most of us have just stayed stagnant um and so part of this is this has just been an ongoing issue for a very very long time and in some ways there's everyone's been talking about the mass resignation and a bunch of retail workers have uh shops have actually raised their wages dramatically i think like mcdonald's is now offering at least ten dollars an hour uh it's just sort of unheard of and so there is this sort of it's it's been this sort of thing on everyone's mind as everyone as as personal debt rises through credit cards um and and without without going into it um with the and it, it the other reason this seems so timely is because of the cost of living uh living in honolulu right and flying and all of these other sort of daily activities or monthly or yearly activities that we partake um so it just sort of made sense to, and I wanted to talk about it, <laughs> be selfish. <laughs> okay, I can stop there or any. Um, I said, I guess one more question would be, you know, um, you know, we'd all, when we we're together with all of you, the artists, you know, we always talked about um, this, how this exhibition would be the catalyst, right? It would be that starting point for um, future action within the community. And I guess, I guess the big question is, what what would you like the the viewer to take away from your work, and how would you like that to impact maybe future action within the community? I, I think the conversation is is a good place to start. Um, there is a there's two camp organizations. Um, there's a living wage organization and I'll, and I'll drop the info in the chat afterwards and then there's the Galihi Worker Center and so there's it's people are sort of starting to take action building collective power there's lots of tech workers who are trying to organize and build unions um, there's been across different states a push to unionize Amazon workers um, I think there was a 
there's been tons of wildcat strikes, strikes that are not called by unions or by anyone in particular, people just start walking out of work. I don't, I think this is a conversation that just isn't going to end. Um, I think my, I hope that others can just sort of engage it and use it to talk about themselves and their relationships to work and their relationships with each other, right? Whether it's about housework or about like clocking in 80 hours at an office or what have you. Great, thank you so much. Um, do you have any last thoughts? No, I'm just honored <laughs> again. Uh, <laughs> I'm nervous, I'm biting my toes, fingers. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and I'll stop. Thank there. you so much, Manu. It's been it's been a true pleasure to work with you, um, and it's been so inspiring inspiring to see your progress. So so thank you so much. Um, we're going Manu. You know, Manu and Gwen will stay on to the end of the conversation um, for further question and answer period. So um, we're gonna move on from here. So um, now I would like to introduce Gwen Arkin. Um, Gwen Arkin is a multimedia artist based on Maui. Um, she finds inspiration in earlier photographic processes, particularly the art of the handcrafted prints that belong to the tradition of light sensitive printmaking. She employs expired film, printmaking, and experimental photographic processes in her search for beauty and unexpected outcomes. Her work is held by international private and public collections including the Hawaii State Foundation on the Culture and the Arts. Her, cooperative, her copper plate photograph, The Garden House, is featured on the cover of Garden Times, the 2016 collection of poetry by W.S. Merwin. Gwen received her BFA from the University of Illinois Chicago and her MFA from the University of Colorado Boulder. She teaches art, photography, and design at the University of Hawaii Maui College. Thank you so much for being here, Gwen. Welcome. Um, it's an honor to be able to sit down and talk story with you. Um, how are you doing today? <laughs> Great. Thanks, Marlene. Thank you for that introduction. And thank you, Manu. That was fascinating. And I actually do have an, a question for you at the, at the end I'd like to ask. Um, so thanks to whoever else is out there for, for joining in on this. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about my inspiration as well as my process for um, the piece that I created. So let me see if I can get my screen going here. And that is not correct. So hold up, let me, don't you gotta love this. Okay. Even though I just practiced, Gotta love technology. Oh yeah. <laughs> All righty. Okay. While we're um, while you're getting it started, did you so Gwen? Do you mainly work in photographic processes, or do you do you work in any other mediums? I know you. I mean, printmaking, obviously. Um, but do you mainly work in photographic processes that then translate into printmaking as well, or? Um, I think for me, that's sort of the base, uh, but I really have gotten a lot more into mixed media and um, using wax and, uh, you know, other mediums in it. Um, but it usually stems from like a photographic, it, it, I just feel like that's sort of the foundation for me. Um, with a lot of my work. All right, I'm gonna try this again. All right, I see it, the correct one, but it's of course not on the right slide. All right. Does that look more like the work in the gallery? Yes. Hooray. Okay, good. All right, so, um, this is my piece, which is entitled Photographs of Hawaiian Algae Cyanotype Impressions. And I began my journey into finding out about 
uh, Hawaiian algae, which is known as limu, through um, an ethnobotany class that I was taking in 2019. Uh, at during the class, uh, we learned about the deep connection that Hawaiians have to marine plants and the significant role that limu plays in Hawaiian culture, not only as a very important food source, but the role that it plays in daily life, uh, the significant role it plays in ceremony, conflict resolution, healing, and many cultural practices. So taking this class and seeing these organisms for the first time in this way, we viewed these beautiful herbarium pressings, which I was just really struck by in terms of their form. And I was, I was um, somebody who enjoys these old processes. Um, I was reminded of work that I had known about from a 19th century botanist named Anna Atkins who was collecting and recording her specimens onto the newly discovered cyanotype process in the mid 1800s. And there she is, Anna Atkins. Um, so it, it, fascinating woman. She was a, a female botanist, which was extremely rare at the time. Um, and she was working in this you know, infancy, infancy of photography. And for the first time, um, able to reproduce something other than say drawings, you know, illustrations were being done in a photographic way. And so she, again, not only is credited with, with being this female botanist, but is considered the first person to publish a book illustrated with photographic images. And this was in 1843. Uh, so, so fascinating person. Um, the other, a woman on the, on the right here is Isabella Abbott, who is another uh, groundbreaking woman scientist. And uh, I definitely want to acknowledge her as well as the first Native Hawaiian woman to receive a PhD in science. She was a world-renowned expert on Pacific marine algae, author of many scientific books and textbooks. Uh, she was the author of the textbook that we were using in my class and a beloved educator. And uh, many of the people that um, I've now studied with in science uh, had her as a as an teacher and, and uh, spoke really, really highly of her. So it was really the work of these two women who were uh, worlds apart, but who had this beautiful shared passion, I think, in Limu and algae, and um, also pays tribute for me to these uh, art processes that I, I enjoy, and also really pays homage to two of my, my favorite things, art and science. So I began this idea of wanting to find um, Limu, you know, something that was so significant to the this place that I was living and make my own collection in the manner of Anna Atkins. And um, so I, I went out and started looking and discovered that uh, Limu was actually really hard to find. And it was as hard to identify as it was to find. So at this point, I thought, man, I'm, I'm really going to need some help here. And I I started reading and speaking to scientists and cultural practitioners and water people and anybody that might guide me. And I also started taking classes. So I was taking classes and, and still am actually taking classes in marine biology and oceanography, uh, just really trying to learn the science behind these plants as much as possible. Um, so every time that I would go out for a beach walk looking for limu to make a print of, um, it was always like a treasure hunt. I never knew what I would find, if I would find anything. And when something did turn up like this, you know, beautiful piece, this red piece here, um, it was such a gift. Uh, it, I was so excited to, to go and to make a print and to add it to my collection. Uh, but again, there was, um, I was, I was concerned that uh, Lima wasn't around, you know, in the way I had even remembered it to be. 
And uh, the one on this one, on my right anyway, is this beautiful brown piece known as Lipoa and Lima Lipoa. And uh, here I live not far from Lipoa Street and Lipoa Beach in Kihei where this limu was known to be and had been known to be plentiful and uh, was never there. So I, I returned many, many times looking for limu lipoa and never found it. And so in this, at this point then, I felt like my collection was almost going to be turning into possibly a visual database of species that were starting to disappear. And there was another level of, of um, concern in terms of the environment and what was going on here. Um, it turns out that I ended up going to Oahu to find Lipoa and, or, and, and, and there's also this piece in the middle, which was something else, hydroclathrus that I was looking for that I wanted. Um, but there was a, just another level of, of, of significance that I felt knowing that these organisms were no longer around in the way they had been. So these are some of the individual pieces that were printed. And um, I, in some ways, see these as portraits. Um, they are unique, each and every one, uh, sort of uh, unique to each and every species. And every time they're, they're printed, they're different and they tend to reveal something different about each organism. Gwen, how many different um, species have you printed so far? I ended up with 76. Oh, wow. And does that even make a is that close to the amount of species that are found here around the Hawaiian so, Islands? Yeah, there's known to be 500. Oh, wow. Yeah, but how easily a lot of those are found, I, I don't know. A lot of them are also, you know, um, microalgae. Mm -hmm. um, so probably difficult to find and identify. Um, yeah. I, I'm hoping to keep going and looking and making more. Uh, so this just shows a little bit of, of some of the technical challenges that might go on with making a print like this. As you can see, uh, you know, cyanotype does beautifully in terms of picking a lot up a lot of detail. Um, but as just uh, an indication of what's going on on the left here, you know, you see these pieces often many of them are very small and delicate and so beautiful underwater and you pull them out of water and they instantly just turn into this glob. So what I would do would be to uh, float these in a tray of water and then using a thin piece of plastic, lift them up and separate them, separate the blades and try to um, you know, create as much space between each one and then print them directly through the plastic. And this was actually the way that Anna Atkins had done it too, although at the time plastic wasn't around and she used, she used mica. I also felt like it was really important that I include the invasive species in the collection. And so to include them, but also differentiate them from the natives. So there are five major um, invasives that are found throughout Hawaii and they're printed in a brown print, slightly different, different chemical makeup that turns them brown. Um, they are now part of the ecosystem. It's my understanding that these will not be eradicated. Um, there's a lot of really fabulous nonprofit groups, grassroots organizations that work really hard to manage the invasives and work with volunteers, you know, to clean certain areas and pull them out of the water um, because they they will take over um, and just you know allow more of the natives then to um, thrive. Um, something else that's great with the process is that it's very uh, user friendly and it's also quite portable. So in this case, uh, you see me making prints right in Waikiki. Um, not all of the, well, as I'd mentioned, I'd gone to collect some natives that I couldn't find on Maui, but also several of the invasives that aren't here, I you know, found 
printed and then made sure that I disposed of not wanting to take any chance of taking anything back to Maui. I did not want to be that person. Um, so made prints right here and uh, that was great. So ultimately this is um, a view of the, the final pieces that I was able to come up with the 76 individual specimens. So I'm going to show a little video now of uh, while I move on to talking about the textiles. Hopefully it'll play. There we go. Okay, good. So there are um, 19 uh, panels and uh, all printed on various types of silk. And my intention with these was to create an immersive experience for the viewer that was not only visual, but also tactile, that there would be a sense of moving into the water, um, the sense of, of seeing these organisms and, and feeling the silk and moving through, you know, simulating the feeling of, of, of walking into the ocean. Um, and then moving through to the to the wall as you would get to you know see the the final species then that were on the back wall on those two walls. Nope, doesn't need to play again. Okay, so what is printed on the panels are actual microscopic images that I was seeing when I was learning to identify the species. So um, as I looked through the microscope as a newbie, I, my mind was blown by the detail and the beauty of, of what these teeny tiny little species were showing me. And what these are really meant to represent is the fact that so much of what goes on in the ocean, this very complex and diverse ecosystem um, the phytoplankton, the cyanobacteria, the dinoflagellates that are floating around in the water unseen to the human eye are, are what is essentially the foundation of life for everything on the planet, which to me was very profound and, and really amazing. So this idea of, of bringing awareness to things that we don't see, to seeing them in a new way, to taking something microscopic and bringing it to a macro level essentially making the invisible visible. Okay, uh, let's see, there was one other one, yes. So again, just another view of what was, uh, I was seeing into the microscope. And you, know, you can see just these teeny tiny little things here that are just so beautiful under the microscope. This green piece, I don't think that I was able to see and I was astonished by its pattern and form and detail. The way that I um, did this was, and you see them printed here on some, some of the darker ones on the silk. So I was actually able to um, photograph through my phone what I was seeing through the microscope and then uh, transfer these to my computer where I created a digital negative and then printed them using the exact same materials that I was using to make the prints. So that is what you're seeing on the various panels. And I'll just show a couple more views of the installation. Oh, this is just one other little video. Um, and uh, this is uh, thanks to Marlene for the suggestion of putting a bench into the middle of the panels, which I hadn't experienced until they were up. And I just found it to be really lovely and a wonderful contemplative place for the viewer to, to stay and watch and, and just sort of be with these these images floating around them. Yeah, I think, I mean, your, the installation is, is quite beautiful. It's quite ethereal. It's a very contemplative space. Um, so yeah, it's, it's so beautiful. Um, we're running a little bit over on time. But, oh, okay. Um, 
Gwen, I did want to ask you, you know, same with um, how we had discussed with Mana, you know, when we were when we were putting this call out, you know, it was a it was to address urgent issues of our time and place. So, you know, one, you know, why why did you feel like creating this work had to be in this time and in, in this place? Like, why now? And then also, you know, what what do you want the viewer to take away from this work and how how do you see this impacting um the community act you know how, how how do you want it to continue through action in the community so what i really sort of got from the the exhibition as a whole to me and this is my me personally feeling that what was being shown were things in our community that were unsustainable you know, whether it was housing, whether it's wages, um, what's going on with the environment and loss of these, these ecosystems and these things, you know, something as lovely and important yet in cultural practices like Limo to Hawaii um, was that this is unsustainable. But what I love with art is that it takes these things out of the context in a way that we usually see them and presents them in a way that is new. And so to look at things this way forced me with many of these things that I had heard about usually in the news um, or on social media in a way that um, allowed me to absorb them and think about them in a whole new way. So I'm hoping that that makes sense and maybe sort of addresses everything. So I say, you know, it's like, well, why Limu now? Why, why not now? You know. We're not gonna go back. How do we go forward in a positive way to mitigate these losses and to gain a better understanding of our of, of all of us as a, as a community? Um, do I have one minute to just, I, I just found the most wonderful um, bit of text. Um, and then also Gwen, before you end as well, could you um, could you also mention the the name of the organizations that you work with in case people yes. want to get involved as well? Thank Absolutely. You. Okay. Let me let me. All right. So I'll read this first, just because it's it's so great. Um, so a couple of years ago, I had read in Flux magazine this great article called Human Nature, and I'd hung on to this magazine because I just I loved the article and just you know wanted to, to, to keep it. And I was reading through it again recently and I asked the author, um, Tim Schuler, if I could share his words because I just felt like it sort of brought everything home for me. So at the end of his article, Human Nature, he says, in the end, it's about noticing. It's about looking around and seeing not an island or an ocean, but our collective home. It's about acknowledging the interminable complexity that undergirds our world that bright cord that binds us to earth and one another. It's about our species endless quest for reciprocity, for symbiosis, for a way of life that leads not to grief, but to gratitude. I'm like getting emotional like reading the words because I think it's so beautiful and poetic. It's quite beautiful. And yeah. it, it encompasses everything that you're talking about. Um, I, yeah. Okay. Then, yeah, so let me quickly move to these awesome folks, as well as the scientists who are doing amazing work. Um, so KUA is this fabulous grassroots organization that's working to restore the coastal ecosystem and um, their website is, is right here. So, so certainly check out all the great work they're doing. And there's just some images here of um, when I got to go out on a on a, a tide walk collecting Limu with them in May was just one of the highlights of this whole process. And then um, we were able to to hang out and right in the park make some prints from our collection. Um, so yeah, and these guys will be um, coming to the workshop so you could meet them and talk story and um, a colleague from UHMC will be here to talk about science in Limu, and then I'll be there to help you make an old tiny print. And Gwen, when is, when is the workshop? And it's November 21st. Wonderful. <laughs> um, well, I would like to open it up to take a few minutes. Um, 
I know Gwen, you said you had a question for Manu and Manu, if you have any questions that came up um, during Gwen's presentation, um, let's open it up here and just talk to Ari for a little bit. So Manu, this idea of talking about what you get paid and this being a conversation, you know, so why, I, I don't, maybe in the history of like, you know, wh why this is sort of a dirty thing and is it just because we have such disparity in terms of our wages? Is it possible for us to turn it into a conversation that sort of allows it to become less polarizing? Any thoughts on that? Uh, two thoughts. Historically, I think for those who are in power, it, it usually helps them for the one to and this is maybe some maybe not all to uh keep that conversation private uh um uh the research now says if you really if you're a boss and you want to have a really good company you should take money off the table so you should just pay people a living wage and just not make it a thing um uh that's one that's one end of the conversation the other end of the conversation is there's lots of shame there's lots of privacy stuff. There's lots of things about what we value and what we see ourselves in value. Um, uh, so it really depends. And there's things you can, people can take quizzes to learn about their money type. There's lots of ways to have the conversation. Um, and there's all this other research that says that like things like credit scores actually are systematically racist. Uh, banks our banks have done lots of systematically racist things. Um, uh, in some communities, inner city communities, banks have systematically opened bank, bank uh, open shops, bank branches where they just take the money out and give out money to uh, business loans to suburbs, but never actually approving loans in the community to take the money from. So there's a lot of ways that uh, have that conversation. I think. I think it does, uh, I mean, it doesn't hurt to just ask, you know, we can ask how much things are, so <laughs> I guess. Yeah, thank you for asking that though. I, I've got one for you. Um, well, I, I have two watching, watching your presentation. What, um, what happened to the limu that you've collected? Where have all the, I mean, do they go back or are they now in your, in your archives or have you donated them yeah what happened to them after you've been they've been photographed oh so after i make the prints what happens to the actual physical organism um it because this is a contact print process so i'm actually printing you know the physical piece directly onto the paper and then it i'm putting it under glass and, and putting it into the sun so it um it's it's no longer in the in the condition that it was when I collected it. So literally for me, I would wash it and I would thank it and I put it in my garden. And and Limu is known for for you know one creating wonderful fertilizer and send it back to the earth. Did you have another question, Manu? Or I did that. You know that that is super interesting. That adds like a layer to the process. My other question is, um, how did you decide that you wanted to drape them? How did you decide that you had to have the pieces draped as well as on the walls? Oh, so in terms of how the the installation of the various panels ended up, um, um, it I think that just really happened very organically. My I really wanted to create as much layering as possible. You know, I felt like when you go into the ocean, there are areas that are clear, and then all of a sudden they be, you know, they become dark because of clouds or, you know, um, even turbidity in the water. You know, when you go into the ocean and there's a lot of turbidity and things aren't as clear. So it was that idea of like creating the simulation of layering with the different panels and uh, and and as you moved through them you would you could see more clearly or then it might be a little less clear so hopefully that answers the question yeah no totally and and just thinking about your piece i was just thinking about all the fractals 
because it was the equation I was talking about play out in, in the way that they grow. So yeah, thank you so much. Yes, yeah, super, super inspiring. Very cool. Well, same, same here. Thank you to you both. Um, we are coming up on the end of our hour, but I do want to ask one final question to the both of you. Um, for the both of you, do you see these artworks ending here? And um, if not, you know, how do you see it progressing? And if it, if this, it is, is a finished piece, what's next for the both of you? Um, I, I'm a full on Limu nerd. Um, <laughs> so I, I would love to, I, I don't know if, I don't know. I don't know if I'll continue collecting and making, you know, more with this particular collection and adding to it. But I, I'm, I'm super fascinated by this idea of using what I'm seeing in the microscope um, to create images and to work more with the textiles. Um, I'm sorry, I'm, I think I'm losing my light. I apologize. Um, so I'm hoping to do more, especially with this idea of these unseen things, you know, these invisible things and finding them, you know, the, the like, like we just looked at zooxanthellae under the microscope and um, some of the, the, the planktons and maybe doing more with these microscopic images onto some textiles. It's just sort of a, you know, like ooh, what could happen there moment for me right now. Right on. No, that's super interesting to hear, friend. Uh, I don't think this, I have two more iterations left in this piece. Um, uh, I, I actually started this, the first iteration was in 2016. So it's been sort of a long work in the process. Um, the really nice thing about having it at, in this part of the show is it's really given me a chance to really take it further. And then I think that, that the, um, uh, uh, the last two iterations are really just sort of partly historical. And then I, I came to art through a lot of activism, through a lot of like reading groups and learning about <laughs> wages and here and India and other parts of the world. And so I think the next thing really is going to be to really to connect this to a global, global conversation. Uh, so that's, that is my next phase. But yeah, thank you for asking. I just want to say thank you so much, Gwen and Manu. Um, you have been so generous with your time. And, you know, we are so grateful to have you here in this artist talk today. So thank you very much for um, talking story with me. Um, I want to say thank you to the audience for joining us today. Um, to find out more about these amazing artists and more about the Artists of Hawaii Now exhibition, please go to our website. Uh, HonoluluMuseum.org. We have links where you can also connect to the various organizations that these artists are working with as well. Um, thank you so much, everyone. Our next talk will be on November 11th. So we hope to see you there. And I want to say good night. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>